I need the Lord. I, I need his spirit. It is a very sobering thing to be tasked with delivering his word to his people. You know, he doesn't just choose anybody to do this. And um, woe to those who would pervert it, who would use it for selfish gain or for anything less than bringing glory to the Father because he has blessed us with this word. So we're in Romans chapter 2, and I'm continuing on in the exposition of Romans 1 today. And um, as a quick summary of what uh, I've preached about up to this point, we started the book of Romans um, being informed of Paul's I don't need glasses, okay. We're being informed of Paul's qualifications. He is announcing himself to this church who knows of him, but they've never been visited by an apostle. And so Paul is making known to them that, A, I am an apostle, you know who I am, and I have been entrusted with the authority of God himself to deliver his message, the gospel of God, the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of salvation to these people in Rome. That the church had been birthed from these Jewish people and Jewish proselytes. They were Gentile people who were, became Jews, went up to Jerusalem for the Passover, and met a man named Peter and the 12 apostles, pouring out of the upper room, filled with the Holy Spirit. They, brought, they got saved in Jerusalem. They went back to Rome, and they started the church. We talked about the conflicts that arose in the church because it was a Jewish messianic church that included national Jews who lived in Rome and Gentiles who became Roman proselytes, who, I mean Jewish proselytes, who then became born-again believers in Messiah. Right? And that's the birth of the church. It's all on a Jewish basis. And then the gospel starts being spread. And all these Roman citizens, Gentiles, are coming into the church. And these conflicts are beginning to arise, whether they should worship as Jews or not as Jews. And it all culminates in a meeting in Jerusalem uh, where James, the brother of Jesus, declares that you do not have to be a Jew to worship Jesus. And that you should only, I think it was three rules he gave them. And then what happened is, so there's conflict in the church, and this conflict rises up throughout Rome, so much so that it reaches the ears of the emperor. The emperor decides he's going to exile every single Jew out of, his, out of Rome. So all the Jewish believers in the church disappear. And for however long that took, this became a Gentile church. And it dropped many of the messianic forms of worship that they were doing. It's not bad. It's not good. They are not obligated. We are not obligated to worship as messianic Jews. We're, we're obligated to worship God in spirit and in truth. Amen? The exile ends. The Jews come back. And there's conflict again. But instead of the Gentiles being the minority, now the Jewish people are the minority because the church has grown. Then Paul goes into a, um, in two simple verses, states the whole basis of salvation and gives us the whole theme for the book of Romans, which is justification by faith. By faith and faith alone, one is saved. One is not saved through law, whether you're a Jew keeping the Torah or whether you're just a Gentile trying to be a good person. You will not be saved that way. Justification comes through faith, by faith. And the, those who are justified, as Paul says in Romans 1, 16 and 17, will live from faith to faith. In other words, it's a faith-filled life in Messiah. And then he goes on in the very next verses. That first he says in 16 and 17 that the righteousness of God is revealed through those who live from faith to faith. And then in verse 18 and 19, 16, 17, yeah, he goes, And the wrath of God is revealed against those who live in unrighteousness. All right? So what Paul is doing is, is forming a di dichotomy. A contrast, that's what the word dichotomy means, between believers and non-believers. And while he addresses non-Jews in Romans 1, 18 through 32, 
And then in Romans chapter 2, he segues to speaking to the Jewish believers... The greater picture of Romans isn't about Jew and Gentile. It's about all people being unrighteous and needing the Savior, Jesus Christ. The, the, the just will live by faith, and justification is by faith and faith alone, not of works so that you cannot boast. And you cannot boast such that, you know, we all think of works as morality. And you'd be right in thinking that. But what else is a work? My even being able to say that I'm the pivotal point of God's moving on me to save myself is a work. Me giving me glory for the decision that I made for Jesus. That's a work. Your faith is a gift from God. That faith is made manifest in your decision for Jesus Christ. All right? Verses 18 to 32 goes into um, the fall of man and the wrath of man that's currently on mankind for a multitude of sins, but, but Paul calls out specifically homosexuality, but then goes into a list of other moral sins. And the reason why I'm telling you this now is because in today's verses, he draws upon those, that list. All right? In Romans 1.32, it says this, Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. That the people in the world today not only practice sin. What is, what is it the difference between a sin and a practice of sin? A practice of sin is a habit. It's something, it's almost, you could say, an addiction. You just keep doing it. And, you know, the irony of this is that he's making it clear that those people deserve to die, those who practice those things. And yet, you know, it's one thing when you get saved to say that, and the Lord delivered me from cursing, when you really didn't do a lot of cursing to begin with. But how about, and the Lord delivered me from lust. Now we're talking about something you practice. Did he just do that? No. For, for each one of us, we each have that sin in our lives, that, that character flaw that we constantly gravitate, to, gravitate towards. And, and you can rightfully say it is a practice. You see, so even in reading that verse, and you read of the condemnation that falls upon those people who not only practice sin, but then give approval to those who practice it. And you cannot but say deep down inside that I somewhat fall into that category, Lord. And so as we're told in the book of Galatians, that the law is a schoolmaster that leads us to Christ. That in the midst of our transparency before an almighty God to say that I am a sinner and I deserve hell. And Lord, I come to you for salvation and for your grace because I can't do it on my own. And that is the mark of a believer. If the mark of a believer was ever the... uh, absence of sin in your life, then none of us would be believers. None of us would be justified. And so in chapter 1, Paul is dealing towards the end of the hypocrisy of fallen men. Having a built-in revelation of the reality of God, because as it says in chapter 1, every single person on earth, God has placed his reality inside their consciousness subconsciousness, inside their conscience. And what we as unbelievers do from birth, as soon as we can start learning, is we start suppressing that. Because we learn, it's almost innate as part of the fall, that we gravitate towards sin. We want to be in charge of our lives. And that is the ultimate, that is the epitome of sin. It's the epitome of the manifestation of the curse in each one of our lives. Your desire to run your own life. To make your own decisions. 
Satan tells you that you'll be assisting God in doing so, when in fact, you are cutting yourself off from him in doing so. So because God has given every human being ever born the testimony of his reality and his identity, in their conscience and in creation all around them, that's the second testimony of the reality of God, the fact that this planet supports life, why is it so difficult to find life in the universe? Maybe there isn't any other. Maybe this is it. Maybe we are the only... That's the testimony. Look all around you, human beings. You will never find life anywhere. And yet I gave it to you. And so there's a hypocrisy that happens. We all know about God. We all know he's true whether we want to admit it or not. And yet we deny him. And so we move into the verses in Romans chapter 2. And I'm going to speak on 1 through 11 today in kind of a general sense because it's a lot of verses. And I don't want to be here all day or keep you all day. Yet I do want to keep you long enough to give you everything that the Lord has for you today. Father God, I come before you and I ask that you would have your way in me in this time. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Glory to you, Father. And glory to you, Spirit. Romans 2.1 Therefore, you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on one another, you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But because of your hard and impenitent, unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself, on the day of wrath, when God's righteous judgment will be revealed, he will render to each one according to his works. To those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil. The Jew first and also the Greek. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good. The Jew first and also the Greek. For God shows no partiality. Now, in today's message, you're, you're going to kind of hear things said saying, well, it seems to me that he shows partiality. Just the statement in and of itself that there's a dichotomy b between believers and unbelievers shows a partiality or else there wouldn't be two groups. But that's not the context of the partiality. It's partiality within God's absolute moral standard for salvation. In God's determining how one can receive grace and how one can receive wrath, it applies to every human being. The Jews don't have anything over the Greeks. That's why he says to the Jew first and also the Greeks. And yet there is a blessing and a curse, I guess you could say, because it almost these two verses about um, his wrath being poured out to the Jew first and then also to the Greek and then his blessings. It almost sounds like the Jews will receive, they'll be the first ones judged. And you see, I titled this verse, The Judgment of God. But I don't want you to think that I, I, I titled it that way because this sermon's all about wrath. It's not. Don't you know that God's judgment is also in salvation and eternal life? And so that's what Paul is speaking about today. The difference. How both of these things, salvation and condemnation, fall within the purview of the judgment of God. In my judgment, God says... You know, you've said that before in your life, or you, you maybe have said it in other words, but basically saying, you know what, I think that, I think that this person really is not a good person. 
Or I think that that person is a good person. I'm going to stay their friend. That's a judgment. And that's all we're talking about today. Now we're going to get a little more specific as far as the ramifications of the judgment. But in that standard, God shows no partiality. The section of verses that we just read stand as a segue from Paul. He's now beginning to transfer from speaking specifically to the Gentiles, as he did in Romans 17, uh, 18 through 32. And by the end of our verses today, and then into the next section of verses, he, he segues, he, he switches over to, to addressing the believing Jews. And the non-believing Jews. I titled this first section, Excuses, Excuses. And I'm referring back to Romans 1.20. If you're in your Bible, you could just jump right back there. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. So I don't really have to talk to you anymore about that. I already did. Nobody has an excuse. Nobody will stand before the judgment throne of God. Remember I said it last week, where they'll give God their justifications for not receiving him as Savior. They'll give God their excuses why they didn't come to faith in him in life. But hey, now that I'm before your throne, I see you're real. Can I come to faith now? No, because faith is the evidence of things unseen. It is appointed a man to die once, and then comes judgment. Your lifetime is your chance. All right? So the Gentiles are without excuse because they have the testimony of nature, of God's reality, and of God's knowledge of them in their conscience. You know, the word conscience literally means with knowledge. What baby is born with a knowledge of physics? What baby is born with a knowledge of cooking? What baby is born with a knowledge of anything? So we can't be talking about worldly things. The knowledge is of God. And then the Jews, they have the testimony of nature. They have God's reality in their conscience. But they had something even more important. He chose them to be the vehicle, the group of people, that A, he would make his own uh, particular treasure, particular possession. And then he gave all the oracles of God to Israel. And from Israel, these go out to the world. And that's why when you become a Christian, you start reading the Bible. And more than half of your Bible are the Jewish scriptures, Torah. Because it teaches the oracles, and that's an interesting word. Oracles, we always assume, if you look it up, the first thing you think is teachings. And you'd be right. But that's not what the word literally means. You know what it means? Burden. Israel was chosen to bear the burden of being a people of God because they were called to be separate and when they weren't they were disciplined they were brought into exile they were meant to be a light to the nations and so through them the gospel went out to the non-Jewish world through their rejection it was a burden on God to see his people reject him it was a burden on Israel to go through the uh, disciplining and the rejection of God for a time. And we can't forget that. That's why, and we'll get to it in the book of Romans, that there's, there's literally, there are blessed people. And that's why at the end, before Christ returns, we're going to see a mass conversion of the Jews who are alive today. That's God's present to them. That's God's thank you to them. That's God's heart to them for what they did in obedience. Or, nah, not in obedience, in fulfillment of the scriptures. Romans 2.1, Therefore you have no excuse, O man. Every one of you who judges, for in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, practice the very same things. The leaders of the church in Rome, and it trickles down to all believers, 
We've got this nasty habit of judging people for things that we ourselves are guilty of. Now, the first thing you need to see is that that judgment, if you look at verse 1, it says, In passing judgment on another, you do what to yourself? Condemn yourself. So what Paul is doing here is defining what that judgment is. Everybody goes through life making judgments. Whether it's about, you know, what clothes you're going to put on or how your brother and sister are acting in church or as Christians or how you yourself are acting as a believer. We make judgments all the time. It's not necessarily wrong. Judgment here is being defined as condemnation. You condemn others for things you yourself do. Now that's judgment. For me to say to somebody in the congregation, sister, I, I got to tell you, I've been, I've been watching and, and I see that you are really um, overbearing on people and, and you're kind of rude to them. As a man who has dealt with anger in the past, I can say that to them, and I would not be judging them. Because I'm not saying, you know what, sister, get out of this church. You're not saved anymore, and you're going to hell. You see the difference? The one is done in the spirit of love and brotherhood. The other one is done in a spirit of condescension, pride, and hypocrisy. Because which one of you could say you've never been judgmental? Right? Right? In, in that way, about the way people are, even how you are. In passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the very same things. In John 8, 7, they continue to ask him, and he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. First thing you need to understand in the spirit of what I'm saying about what judgment literally is talking about is they were going to kill her. They weren't going beside the lady and say, look, you, you need to repent because committing adultery is not okay. And if you are going to be a part of this community, of this people of God, you need to repent or we will put you out. As a matter of fact, we are putting you out until you repent. That's not what they were doing. They were killing her. They were condemning her to death. And he says, you want to throw stones? You yourself are going to get condemned to death. And that, we're talking about hell. We're talking about eternal death. The next thing we have to talk about is hypocrisy. You who condemn the other, you do the same thing. Verse 2, we know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things things. Psalm 9, 7 through 8 tells us, but the Lord sits enthroned forever. He has established his throne for justice and he judges the world with righteousness. He judges the people with uprightness. What does that mean? He's not wrong. When he sends someone to hell, they deserve to go to hell. doesn't matter how angelic they're standing before the throne saying, how could you send me to hell? He's right. They won't be doing that before the throne, though. They'll be gnashing their teeth at God. Rich, can you do me a favor and just shut the um, fans off? I forgot to turn them off. Thanks. <clears throat> I see clothes starting to get bundled. <sighs> All right. Matthew 7, 3 through 5 says this. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. One of the hardest things about being a pastor, a, a, a leader, an elder, is you feel a sense of accountability towards the people that God has placed within your congregation. 
a leadership of and accountability to and, and accountability for them towards you. And, and as believers, and we're trying to teach them, we're trying to feed them, we're trying to grow them. And so when we see them doing something that's clearly wrong, but we also have a problem with, what do you do? I'm either going to be a, well, I'm either going to be a compromised minister and not say anything because I myself am compromised, or it's going to be the onus, the catalyst, the motivation for me to get control of my body, to put it under. Paul says he disciplines his body. He beats his body into submission. How can I lead you into holiness if I'm not holy? And so... It, it, it has really motivated me and, and to, to deal with the things that are my main issues. And it should do the same for you. Because just because you're not a pastor does not mean you are exempt. You are called as a believer to speak into other people's lives. Both blessing and correction and, you know, all the things. It won't be as on a larger scale as me, but, but you still are a believer. If you see your sister or your brother stumbling and into sin, you, you want to be able to come beside them and, and help them. But you can't rebuke them if you're doing the same thing, can you? You see, so what that does, if we are truly following the Lord, is it motivates us as we walk together with one another to elevate our holiness, to, to, to uh, strive to examine ourselves, to see if we're in the faith, to put down, to really cry out to the Lord, because that's what it takes many times when you are trying to overcome a sinful habit in your life. You need to cry out to the Lord. I mean, you need to do it in tears. I, I said this last week. For me, it's, woe is me. Woe is me. I do these things. And it's really helped me. <clears throat> Second point I have for you is I'm going to talk about greasy grace. A license to sin. Romans 2 3. Do you suppose, O oh man, you who judge and practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Um. I want to shoot back real quick just to remind us. Romans 1.29. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness. What is covetousness? It's when you want something that doesn't belong to you. And you, you, you envy for it. Malice, they are full of envy, murder. Hatred is murder. If you have hatred, you are a murderer. Strife, deceit, maliciousness, they are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, not only do they do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. And let's not forget the one he called out specifically, homosexuality. How many of you within the church have heard of ministers who have fallen and that homosexuality was their sin? You don't think they ever preached from the pulpit about homosexuality? We are called to repentance. Repentance means this. This is literally what the repentance means. All this is living unrighteously. You've just repented. It's step one. Step two is you work farther away from those things. You stop sinning. And you walk closer to God. Follow his ways. God calls all men everywhere to repent. All men everywhere, all women everywhere to repent. Romans 8, 6 through 8 tells us, For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. You see, we're not just talking about hell and death and wrath. I, I want you to experience life and peace and, and eternal joy. The blessing of knowing that your father's looking down at you as an imperfect human and going, and he's going, man, I'm so proud of you. you. You fought that time and you won. 
right? You're not always going to win. But you know what? What a great thing. Think about if you have any children, how wonderful it is when you see them do good things. Whether it's walking for the first time or, or bringing you an extra napkin at dinner. Whatever it is, right? For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot submit to God's law. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Oh, yes, I can. I can choose God. I, God can break me, and, and then I'll choose him. No, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You want to show me your elect? Repent and believe. Because only God can help you to do that. Only God can give you the, the, the faith to do that and the power to do that and the desire to do that. Because those in the flesh cannot please God. Galatians 5.13 You were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. But through love serve one another all right serve one another you know one of the one of the hallmarks of christianity one of the clarion calls of the christian is i live for the benefit of others it makes me tired sometimes it makes me anxious sometimes it makes me angry sometimes it doesn't matter i am to forge ahead and live for the benefit of others and so are you. Romans 2.4, God is kind. This may be the most important verse today. Do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? God's kindness, what is God, let's define that first. His kindness is he doesn't just blow you up. He doesn't just go, you know, Paul, don't be. <laughs> or better, or even worse, Sam, go to hell. <laughs> you live a lifetime of God's kindness towards you. That's the definition of it. He does not pour his wrath out on you in condemnation. He has given you, what does the Bible say? His mercies are new every morning. Every day of our life is an opportunity to turn and to start walking towards him again. The more you do so, the better you'll get at it. I want you to know that. The more you do so with an honest heart towards God, the more he will empower you in doing this. If you do it as a hypocrite, all bets are off. His kindness, I already defined that for you. His forbearance, what does that mean? He puts up with you. He puts up with you. I mean, even as Christians, he puts up with us. But, but specifically before we become believers, he's bearing, he's forbearing the entire world. You don't think he's got enough of a record, a criminal record on every single human being to, if, in his own righteousness to just destroy the world? Of course he does. But he has appointed a number to be saved. And until that number is reached, here's what the Bible says. There's a number of, of saved, total group. Of that total group, there's a number of non-Jews who will be saved. Now, there's Jews being saved all the time as well, but dealing specifically with the Gentiles, there is a definite number. And when that number is reached, that's going to be the, the, uh, the, the time of his coming. First thing that's going to happen, in case this happens, you want to know this, you're going to see tons of Jews come to faith in Christ. So much so that it'll make the news. It'll be on CNN even. I mean, that's a big deal. All of Israel is coming to faith in Jesus Christ. They call him Yeshua, Hamashiach. Know that the time is near. His patience, forbearance and patience are two sides of the same coin. He puts up with you 
and he doesn't pour his wrath out on you. As you are coming along or not coming along, you're either, you're either coming along in, in faith in God or you are building for yourself an extensive criminal record <laughs> to be used at the throne of God when he opens up the book of works and your name's in it. The purpose of kindness, therefore, is not so that you can continue in sin. It's, it's, it's there, his forbearance, his patience, is so that you will come to the place where you understand that comes first, and then desire to forsake your sins. It's not a license to sin, and it means you have an appointment with repentance. May that day be today. May that day be every day in your life. King Solomon in Proverbs 28, 13 said this, Whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper. But he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. You got bad news? You got good news. Who's somebody who, trans, who conceals their transgressions? They refuse to acknowledge Christ as Lord. They insist that their sense of morality is right, even if it goes directly against God's law, which we saw in last week's sermon with homosexuality and just a bunch of the things that's going on in the world today, contrary to God. Divorce, with, um, absent of adultery, divorce, right? Against God. The Apostle Peter tells us in Acts 3, 19 through 20, repent therefore and turn back, turn back to God, that your sins may be blotted out. That is the only way sins are blotted out. Now, he's telling this to the, the people in Rome, to those in Rome, whether they are Gentile leaders or, or Jewish leaders of the church. That's who he's speaking specifically to. Repent. Stop doing this, this abhorrent thing in the sight of God where you're, you're telling people they're going to hell and you're kicking them out of the church. You're doing all that, and you are guilty of that yourself. Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. You see, in repentance, times of refreshing come. God knows your struggles. He knows that when you're addicted to something and you, you say, he knows the anguish you're going to go through. He knows the temptation you're going to go through. He knows the suffering you're going to go through. It, it's, like, uh, it's, like, it's like withdrawal from a drug. And he, he promises you that times of refreshing will come. Your, your acts of obedience towards God do not go unnoticed. Third point, the day of God's wrath in verse 5 of Romans chapter 2. Because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourselves on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. That's, that's pretty scary. As a, a, a leader in a church, I mean, this obviously trickles down to everybody, you know, hypocrites in general who, who are saying they are followers of God and yet, yet they're, they're condemning the sinners out there, but they have these secret sins that are the exact same thing. The day of God's wrath will be revealed. It's going to be revealed according to one, a person's own works. In verse 6, he says, he will re render to each one according to his works. That applies to all unbelievers, whether they're in the church or not. You see, you could be an unbeliever in the church. It's what's called a false convert. All right? Believers aren't judged by their works. They're, they're judged by the grace of God and the righteousness of Christ that's been imputed to you, put on you. All right? Now, I say that kind of half correctly because we will be rewarded for the works that we have done. But this is speaking specifically to those who never repented. Because their hearts are what? Their hearts are hard and impenitent. Hard. 
the truth can't penetrate it. Whether you're in the church or not, you're preaching from the pulpit and you're a hypocrite and it's not even making a dent in there. Or you're sitting in the, in the pew and it's not making a dent. Or you're not even in the church because you hate God. It's all just different degrees of the same thing, isn't it? Right? So it's the revealing of God's judgment. Second, it's the mental character and inner works of a person. Works are just a, uh, outer works. What people see you doing, hear you saying, things like that are all just manifestations of what's going on inside of here. And the first thing that God does through his word, through sanctification, is he changes the person inside. And so what people start seeing is less of those nasty things and more of those. And what's supposed to happen is that's supposed to happen to you. And then your friends and your relatives or people you know, co-workers, they go, what's different about you? God is changing me. I can't begin to tell you the joy I have in my heart that he, I have been trying to stop cursing for so long. I have tried to stop watching porn for so long. I have tried to stop being nasty and jumping down people's throats for so long. And he is doing this work in me. And I want to tell you about Jesus. He can do this for you. So believers are being contrasted here in verse 7 uh, against unbelievers. So in 6 and 7, uh, no, in 5 through 7, he says, Because of your heart and impenitent heart, you're storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath, when God's righteous judgment will be revealed, <clears throat> he will render to each one according to his works. Then we go into 7. To those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. For those of you who think that God isn't impressed with your desire to obey him, that verse is for you. Like any father, he is so, I mean, I, I could see God on the throne in heaven crying tears when you have struggled with something for so long and now you're not, not overcome it, although yes, that'll make him happy, but in the fight to overcome what parent doesn't just bubble over to see their child wanting to do what they have asked them to do? No matter how imperfectly that looks at first. Practice makes perfect, right? And grace makes perfect. Glory, honor, and immortality. You see, those who, by practice and well-doing, they're taking the faith that they profess to have and they're giving it feet. All right? And for that, we are seeking to glorify God. We're not seeking to glorify ourselves because anyone who's overcome a sin that they've battled against knows they didn't do it on their own. Right? We glory in God. We give Him the glory so in our well-doing, we are glorifying God. We seek to do that. And we are seeking to honor him. You see, when you are um, an unrepentant sinner who professes Christ, you bring dishonor to, to Almighty God. You bring dishonor to Jesus Christ who you claim to profess, and yet you're just, you're just this filthy person who, who is not manifesting any of the fruits of salvation. So peace, love, joy, kindness, forbearance, patience... Love, right? We should be changed. We should be a new person who goes, God, I want to live for you. Any blocks and obstacles put in our way by those they are trying to reach, despite that, we still persevere with others. That's one of the works. You want to be a witness for Christ. And, and when you're saved and you, and you seek to, to be that light, people put obstacles in your way. You persevere. Not only do they do that, but behind every unsafe person is, is the enemy who wants to work through them 
to shut you up, to knock you down, or to kill you. <laughs> we are up against a formidable enemy, formidable enemy in this world. But take heart, brothers and sisters. God is more powerful than Satan. Amen? The spiritual enemy um, throws what at us? He throws fiery darts. And he shoots them usually at your mind. But God is greater. And here's something to make you think. As God's peculiar people, you are placed in this circle. You're in there. It's called God's heart, God's love, God's grace. Satan's outside that circle shooting darts at you. Every single dart that makes it, he opens the door to, to it to come and hit you. So that tells me that when you're dealing with the fiery darts of Satan in your mind, that God is trying to tell you something. You have to deal with this. This is something we're going to work out in you for my glory. It kind of gives you a different perspective when you feel like you're being attacked like that. Deuteronomy 15.11 says, For there will never cease to be poor in the land. Therefore I command you, you shall open wide your hand to your brother, to the needy and to the poor in your land. The greatest act of charity or self-sacrifice. We're called to be generous in our charity to those who are in need. But the greatest, Ephesians 5.1-2. <clears throat> Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. And I think of Christ and I think about like the first thing I think about here is well, what did he do? He hung on a cross. He, he died for us, right? And then I think about, okay, so love, that means so I'm, I'm supposed to die and I can't ever say anything, you know, I can't ever correct anyone because that's not nice. And No, Jesus corrected people. He chided unbelievers. He chided believers. He did it all for love's sake that they might come to a place of repentance. It's not an excuse to be mean. It's not an excuse to be abusive. But love we have to follow Christ's example. He was pretty direct. He didn't leave much up to innuendo. Selflessness is not a trait of the fallen nature. The nature of Christ, the mind of Christ, compels us to live self-sacrificial lives for the benefit of others. And there is no greater benefit, there is no greater self-sacrifice than the giving of the gospel. That is the greatest thing you can do for a homeless man. Obviously, if he needs a coat, you're supposed to give him a coat. You're not going to make much of an impression if you kick him and then tell him to give him the gospel, right? Then there's a person who's called the selfish seeker. Romans 2.8. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey, uh, for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. Why? Because they're in disobedience to the truth. They're in disobedience to God's word. Those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth. You see how there's a, there's a contrast being set up? Self-seekers do not obey the truth. Why? Because the truth is about selflessness. If you want to live by God's word, you're going to have to become a selfless person. Ain't no doubt about it. So if you're not obeying the truth and you're being selfish... You are obeying unrighteousness. In other words, you have fallen into the camp of thought of Satan. It's an inescapable fact that as Christ poured his life out for the benefit of others, so you too, the believers in Jesus, must pour their life out for the benefits, benefit of others. All right? 
All selfishness is disobedience born of unrighteousness. It is in direct opposition to Christ, his mission, his words, miracles, and his heart. Now think about this. I'm giving you this kind of hard word because I'm, I'm giving you some good stuff, you know, about those who obey, comfort, right? But these are leaders in the church. He's writing to a church. And basically, both barrels blasting at the leadership saying, and you know why? Because they're in... Um, division. The Jewish believers, uh, the Messianic believers, and the Gentile believers are in conflict. And it shouldn't be that way. It shouldn't have been that way then, and it shouldn't be that way now. I've had to deal with that. I know, I know numerous pastors who have not dealt with that yet. They don't say anything, but I know. All selfishness is disobedience born of unrighteousness. It's in direct opposition to Christ. The unbeliever by nature is selfish, disobedient, and seeks to obey unrighteousness. Now, the argument that the unbeliever will give to me is that there are plenty of generous, selfless people who aren't Christians. And my response to them would be, well, in that person's life, who's in charge? doesn't matter how good they are. They're in charge. Not God. They're not living to glorify God. They're not living to bring honor to God. And it doesn't matter where you direct that honor and, and respect and recognition, whether it's yourself or someone else. As long as it's not God, you're in the camp. Who gets the glory in their case? It's never God. Without repentance and belief in Christ, their lot will be God's wrath and fury, both now and as they increase in unrighteousness and at the judgment throne of Christ where the ultimate in wrath is revealed. Hell. So Paul makes a general declaration. What awaits the worker of evil? Verse 9. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil. Tribulation, distress. That means trials, problems, anguish, pain, torment. That's what awaits. Well, that's what's actually being revealed in the workers of unrighteousness now on the earth. I, I made a point of saying it last week. This country's under God's wrath. We're under the judgment of God. And the proof of it is the increase of lawlessness. God has removed the restraining power largely from the people of this land. And so, and I, the example I gave was how in the 50s, if you were gay, you were gay. Gay. Now there's like 10 different names. And then I even went on to explain to you how now, you know, now that that's made okay, the next thing that's being, um, uh, trying to make okay is pedophilia. Man-boy love. The other thing that's now reared its ugly head, well, there's, there's two others. There's one that's bestiality. If you read the newspaper in the last year, you have read articles on uh, people in Europe who love their cow. I, I'm telling you, I, well, I read the newspaper, I read two papers every day. And how about this? Falling in love with your sex doll. There's a guy in, I don't know, some country in Europe who has married his sex doll. Now, this is all fringe stuff. But so is all the stuff that's now legal. There's an agenda going on here, ladies and gentlemen. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil. The Jew first and also the Greek. You know, God holds Israel accountable. Yet, yeah, it was written in the, in the, it was prophesied that, you know, there'd be all these problems with Israel and their obedience to God. And that through that disobedience, that Messiah would be revealed and he'd become, he'd be revealed as not only the savior of Israel, but the savior of the whole world. But that doesn't release anybody who doesn't believe in Christ from their guilt just because they're Jewish. To the Jew first and also to the Gentile. That stands as well for, the, for all people. All right. 
There are three dichotomies, um, contrasts, and comparisons made in Romans 1 and 2. I'm going to give them to you right here. The first one was in Romans 1.17. For in it, the power of the gospel of God, in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. And then in verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Good, bad, believers, unbelievers, consequences. All right. Next one, Romans 2, 7, and 8. To those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. And then finally, Romans 2, 9, there will be tribulation, that's pressures and troubles, and distress, that's great anguish, anxiety, and sorrows for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek. And then the opposite side, the dichotomy of that, verse 10. But glory, defined as magnificence and great beauty, splendor, perfection. Don't you know that's what awaits you in eternity? We're going to get these glory bodies. Your, your body's going to be reanimated. From the elements of the ground, or the sea, wherever it is, or the belly of the fish. They'll all be pulled together, but it won't look like you. I mean, it will, but you'll be clothed with the glory of God, the radiance of God, the splendor of God. You will acknowledge that glory comes from God. It's not from you. And you will glorify God in even that. But glory and honor, that's respect and esteem. And peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek. Do you see how Paul is going to great pains here to speak to the leadership of Rome as well as to all the believers? This isn't just a, this isn't just a letter to the Roman leaders. It's a letter to the Romans. So it has application to every single one in the church then. This is not a game. God promises blessings and life to all those who, because they are believers, have set their feet on the path of discipleship and are walking in love. We're practicing a selfless life of love. We're not great at it. We're hopefully we're getting better at it with every day. And he wants you all to know then and now that if you are not in this walk, you are serving Satan. And you're, you need to look at your salvation, your profession of faith, and maybe reevaluate. Because he does, he's being honest with them because he does not want to see any of them go to hell. And that's why he goes to pains. I think it was verse 6 when he says, you know, the kindness of God is meant to lead you to repentance. That's not 6. Verse 4. Don't you know that he's been kind with you? He's been kind with you. He's been putting up with you. He's been patient with you. Because he wants you to live lives of repentance. It doesn't mean you'll never mistake again. It doesn't mean you'll never sin again. It means that you are set on living for the Lord. And what happens when you are, is when you do fall short, your conscience pricks you. It's the Holy Spirit. And what happens is you come immediately before the throne. You might be doing it right in front of the person you just sinned with or against. And in your head you're going, Lord, forgive me. <laughs> you know? <clears throat> and he's going to give the glory and the honor and the peace for everyone who does good. The Jew first and also the Greek. You see how he's gone in the last three or four verses, twice he said, or maybe it was more, I think it was more, to the Jew first and also the Greek. And then he says why in verse 11. For God shows no partiality. Now, his treatment of Israel is different than his treatment for the Gentile world because as I said, Israel was given the oracles of God. But his standard for salvation is the same for Israel as it is for the non-Jewish world. Jesus Christ, I am the way, the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. I am the door to the sheep, to the sheepfold. 
There is no other name under heaven by which a man or woman can be saved but Jesus Christ. Whenever you start thinking about the words of the Bible as you're reading, going, it sounds like he, he, that you know anyone can go to, to God if they're a good person. Remember, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. As you read all the Bible and you start remembering scriptures from all over the Bible, you will be able to put things together in the proper context that are being spoken in. Christianity is not a universalist religion. Christianity is not a moral-based religion. That's why a, a Mother Teresa can go to hell. I'm not saying Mother Teresa went to hell. I'm just, I'm just saying somebody really good can go to hell. Christianity is a faith, a grace-based religion religion God is just he shows no partiality between Jew and Gentile he is clear and concise in his standards and judgments he will not compromise on how he's going to judge individuals and he is unbiased faith or unbelief no gray area grace or condemnation heaven or hell it's not a question of if you will live forever. It's a question of where. It's a geography question. And another dichotomy in comparison of the believer to the unbeliever, I'm going to close with this set of verses, Hebrews 9, 27 to 28. Just as it is appointed for a man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. It is appointed for the unsaved to die once and then face the judgment. But for the saved, Christ already died and endured the judgment. You go free. Amen? My friends... Um, there's new people here today. Please, this is not a game. God calls all people everywhere to repent. He doesn't wink at sin anymore. He has come to save. He, his desire is that you would live a life of eternal joy with him. But friend, that is not the, the natural state that anyone is born in. You must come to the way, Jesus Christ through the doorway of grace, through faith in what he did. Amen? Amen. Father God, I thank you for this word, Lord, and I pray it has gone out as you desired. And I ask, Lord, that it would bear fruit in the hearts of each person, Lord, um, somehow, some way, Lord, that your word has the power. I trust in your word spoken, Lord, to make the difference. And I pray for each one here, each one online, each one who will see this on YouTube. I pray that God would give you the gift of faith and that you would turn to him today. Repent and believe in the name of Jesus. Amen.